Hello and welcome back to Mother Tap, your eyes, ears and finger on the poles for all parents around the world. Let's get going, shall we? Oh God, I literally keep looking at myself and thinking, God, I need Botox. I need, I need something. I look so. so I've had it recently, so I look a little bit more. This third kid is like sucking the energy out of me. It's just killing me. Anyway, all right. You look great to me. Thank you. (laughs) You do. We are so incredibly excited to welcome Anna Matha back to Mother Tongue. Anna, how are you? Hey, I'm good, thank you. I'm good. Yeah, I've just been complaining about the weather over here. Um, so it's it's nice to sit down here, all cosy, and have a chat with you. To be fair, you are allowed to complain about the weather. It is July <laughs> in the UK. You should be full sunshine, it's shorts true. on. Builders tan, you know, oh, where know. is this? It, I know. We were back in June and it was miserable. And I think it's such a tonic, especially, you know, for mums in the thick of the the tired stages. Sunshine is just so uplifting, isn't Pink. it? I remember being yeah. sleep deprived and it, in the in the depths of challenging mental health times with my second. But it was July and it was hot and it was sunny and that just really helped. Mm. So I think, yeah, the grey drizzle over here in July can can no. go can go no, no. save that <laughs> for winter happy please. we are not anyway anna before we get into today's conversation can you please tell our lovely listeners who don't know you a little bit about yourself yeah so i am a mum. i've got three kids they are now all at school which has been absolutely game changing in so many different ways they are five seven although my one is eight tomorrow and he definitely wanted you to know about that so five nearly eight and nine and i'm a psychotherapist by trade um historically worked in all the kind of the normal settings that you think about and little rooms with their box tissues and a couple of chairs or my living room up here where I'm sat with a blue sofa and I would speak to clients here but over the years I've shared a lot more on social media both about my own mental health journey but layering and weaving in all of my kind of clinical knowledge and understanding because I can talk really openly about things like guilt and shame and intrusive thoughts, anxiety and postnatal depression, because I I have this kind of clinical understanding as well. So I don't need to feel the shame around my own mental health. So I kind of leverage that and just throw it all out there in the hopes that it will help people have a little bit more compassion and understanding for themselves. So I do that any which way I can. I write books, I do podcasts, I do talks, I share bits and pieces because I'm just really passionate about yeah, getting into the hands and, and minds of, of mums and hopefully being a bit more of a compassionate voice than we are so often to ourselves. So that's yeah. that's me really. And it's it's so prevalent in especially in mums. Mm. And I know from my own journey, I didn't really I was I was really lucky actually. I had never really suffered um massively from mental health until I had kids and then mm. When it first started, I was like, oh, my God, someone needs to check me into a mental institute because I was so overwhelmed with the thoughts and the feelings. I was like, I am going mad. And it was wild. Um, But before we get into questions around mental health during pregnancy, can you talk to us a little bit about your own mental health experiences, especially as a mother? Yeah. So I think beforehand I had had a lot of anxiety and worry and rumination and worry about what people think and people like my whole diary was basically full of anything that would please other people so I said yes to everything and I would probably I would I would be quite frazzled behind the scenes probably a little bit resentful um but that was how I felt like I deserved my place in the world was just being mm. nice and being kind and saying yes so when I had kids perfectionism doesn't really translate to parenting it is unless you just want to be constantly beating yourself up so I tried very much to apply my perfectionism and my drive and my desire to get everything right to parenting and it was an absolute it was it it just didn't work (laughs) it didn't work and the routines didn't work the you know I couldn't get everything right I couldn't respond in the calm patient way that I thought I would and should all the time so I basically had this really hard life lesson of realizing that I couldn't always be the helper that I needed help that I couldn't always do everything well that I'm a messy flawed human just 
trying to do my best and that has to be good enough otherwise I'm just constantly going to be beating myself up criticizing myself and essentially kind of yeah had this inner bully and it did not help my parenting um so I've just really learned that I need people and I need to accept that good enough is is good enough and I need to apologize when I get it wrong but I will get it wrong and connection is so much more important than you know a perfectly balanced lunch or like a brilliant day out that normally just falls to <laughs> you know it was just it was, life is just messy and I'm messy and that has been the biggest learning for me um yeah that will that's changed my life really so mental health and motherhood yeah I'm it's still on that one. journey it's a big it's, one it's a big yeah. one yeah forever, it's, it's something that's constantly changing constantly evolving there's yeah. new curveballs that come all the time I mean I'm in the midst of um a new one for me at the moment and I'm hoping as you mentioned mum of three you might be able to help me out a little bit with this um we are I'm pregnant with my third and wow. to be honest this was never this was never my long-term plan I was kind of always like you know I'm two and done and I was really lucky I had a little boy and then a little girl both really healthy um, and then something happened at the beginning of this year. I just started in my mind. I was like, I just feel too young to be done. Mm. I feel like this can't be it. I don't think I want it to be over and convince myself that number three would be a good idea. <laughs> Even though my husband was like, no, 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 no. This was not our plan. And we finally got on the same page took a lot of convincing mm. and now I'm here you know 15 weeks of morning sickness later oh, I'm exhausted I mean I'm being dragged by my kids in one direction work in the yeah. other direction the heat the swelling yeah. the bloat I'm like why am I doing this and it's been a real mental challenge to get excited about this third baby because mm. I feel like I'm you know, I have a short fuse and no patience with my two children that are here. And I just, I'm like, oh, why am I doing this? Like regretting <laughs> all my life choices. And no one really ever talks about prenatal. Yeah. I mean, I don't think I have prenatal depression. I think that would be taking it a, a step too far, but we always talk about postnatal depression mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the baby blues and kind of what happens when the baby arrives. But I imagine there's lots of women out there who feel like me, who have, you know, gone from one to two or two to three or maybe even three to four or more and might be feeling this way. And I mean, I'm guessing it's very normal, but how how does one tackle these feelings without just feeling like a really shit person and very yeah. ungrateful? I think that's it, is when you feel like a shit person, that's normally because you're saying, I shouldn't feel this way. I should yeah. be feeling grateful. I should be skipping around on this, you know, pregnancy glow fueled cloud of joy and gratitude doesn't and exist. Yeah, it doesn't exist it doesn't exist and I think often a lot of the shame and the self-judgment comes when we're not allowing all those feelings just to coexist but mm. you are grateful and there's a level of excitement and a, but there's also you know it's okay to to miss what was good it's okay to miss a bit more hormonal stability it's okay to miss a bit more ease in in your movement and your sleep and having a bit more energy it's okay to miss the things that were good so I think when it's just a mishmash of feelings isn't it and it's it's mm -hmm. almost like we've we're led to believe that we should feel grateful all the time as if that's the only feeling that should be associated with parenting and it's so untrue and I think when we overlook the full complexity of emotions that we can feel at, at any one time. We often do feel that shame and that judgment and that the frustration with ourselves. It's as if I remember leaving the uh, the hospital with the baby. It's as if I, I, I left all other emotions there that I should never again feel overwhelm I should never again feel frustration never again feel loneliness never again as if this baby should complete me um mm. and we know it doesn't work like that especially when I'm working with parents that have had a really challenging journey to pregnancy so that sometimes there's even more pressure then well I should this is what I wanted we wanted yeah. this so much so therefore I shouldn't be feeling overwhelmed I shouldn't miss my old life I shouldn't and it's all these shoulds and shouldn'ts as to how we should and shouldn't feel and 
I think one of the biggest things that gives us this kind of drop shoulder feeling is when we say to ourselves, right now I feel really overwhelmed. I feel quite scared. I feel like I'm standing on the precipice of immense change in my family. And that's big. And it's all right mm. to feel all those feelings. And mm. I also feel joy and gratitude, of course. You know, mm. I wish we didn't have to caveat that all the time. Yeah. You know, so true. We, talk, we do it, we caveat all the time. And it just kind of perpetuates this feeling of we shouldn't, you know, we should always feel grateful. Yeah. We do. And, it's, and we are. It's, as a bottom line. It's, all, it's also this kind of um, un, the unknown. And this, this feeling comes in you know when you're going from none to one or you know five to six kids it's that am I making the right decision mm. and I feel at the moment that's really playing on my mind yeah. you know is this the right decision for us as a family I mean it's too late to go back now let's be honest <laughs> it's too late it's too late but, still. but it's yeah it's the black and white right and wrong yeah like how many things in life really fit into either of those categories everything and and I think it would be easier to make decisions as well in life if we and in motherhood if we just recognize that I think sometimes we want someone to tell us that that's the you've made the right decision end of story don't worry about it anymore it's going to be fine this is this is your path this is how it's meant to be or that was the wrong decision you need to correct that somehow and this sometimes is me. We, can't, we can't go back and you know, I, yeah it just life isn't really like that and I think the sooner we allow ourselves to recognize that it's life is just like 50 shades of gray mm -hmm. you know this is where we're living like I've just written a whole book about kind of accepting uncertainty it's really hard because I think we yeah. want to know we're getting it right we want to know we're not messing our kids up we want to know we're not making the wrong choices we want a teacher to come along and just give us loads of ticks because it's mm. tangible so true yeah <laughs> so true and I mean you speak there about the uncertainty another thing that I know is so prevalent in women especially women who have either struggled to conceive or experienced loss is the anxiety in those first 12 weeks yeah. that again there's this I mean there seems to be more space that's being created to discuss this now and people are often more open about being pregnant at, a, um, at an earlier phase during the pregnancy but the fear of miscarriage in those first 12 weeks and not knowing if the baby has a heartbeat or not yeah. and not knowing if you going on that run is going to trigger something that's going to cause miscarriage yeah. and the amount of messages I've had from women over the last you know six weeks about them feeling exactly the way I felt mm -hmm. um, has been quite remarkable really I mean what advice would you give to yeah. that that mum that woman who's going through those first 12 weeks and really feeling the fear and the anxiety oh gosh it really activates that that awareness of our vulnerability doesn't it it yeah gets us really in touch with all the potentials and possibilities in life for loss and pain and things not going how we yearn them to be and I think that's it it's it's just really emphasized our vulnerability when we're pregnant especially when we I used to want a window I used to think wouldn't it be great if there was just a little window I could just look in and check that everything was okay because yeah. it's the unknowing and there's and I think what it does it it just really draws our focus into the uncertainty that if we're aware of is there all the time in life all the time I don't know what's going on in my body now. You know, there could be something going on in my body that I'm not aware of. I could get a phone call later on today. I could, I don't know. There is so much unknown. And I think normally in life, we have our ways of avoiding thinking about it or trying to stop the rumination, but it just feels so much more pertinent when we're, when we're pregnant. And I think just mothering ourselves just mothering mm. ourselves through those moments, you know, what what we want most of all is someone to come along again, like the teacher, to give us the tick. We want we want a grown up to come along and put their hands on our shoulders and look us square in the eye and promise us that everything's going to be okay. Yeah, and we know that no one can do that, and that's so hard. But that's that's you know, this is a bigger picture of life is that we yearn for this. So how can we mother ourselves through the uncertainty? You know, if our kids are having a really hard time and they're feeling scared, you know, we might want to promise them that everything will be all right, but we know heart of hearts that we can never truly promise that. So what do we say? We say, I'm here. 
I know you're worried. I'm here. I'm here. I'm doing this with you. And how can we offer that? to ourselves in those moments of uncertainty and we can say it's okay you know it's it's not surprising it feels nerve-wracking right now and again when our kids are feeling scared you know we don't go along to them and say for goodness sake stop don't worry about this it's ridiculous it's never going to happen don't be stupid you know toughen up we say to them I know you're worried I know you're worried sometimes things do feel scary sometimes things do feel big I'm here And I think it's just mothering ourselves in that way when we feel scared or anxious instead of doing the critical, for goodness sake, like I've been through this before, it's probably going to be fine. You know, that kind of that critical coming down hard on ourselves, just giving us some of that nurturing, you know, what can we do? How can we seek some reassurance? Can we, how can we, you know, this worry that we have right now, how can we work out whether it's something we need to get checked out? Um, do we need to take a watch and wait or do we just need a friend to say some warm kind words Mm. to us or can we offer those words to ourselves in this time of in this moment of uncertainty it's hard it's hard because it's hard not because we're failing yeah and I think that's that is a a lot of what we need and just to say to ourselves yeah it is hard it is scary sometimes having the space for compassion as well and I remember someone said to me I can't remember who it was they said um you know speak to yourself in the mirror and just reassure yourself that it's going to be okay and that your body was made to carry a baby and that you've done this before and you know just stay positive basically and this is really not normally my my go-to but at this point I was like I will try anything and actually it really helped it kind of gave me the pep in my step that I needed in those dark moments um, mm. then the sickness really kicked in and, and I kind of felt reassured weirdly by the sickness. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's that is more kind of, problem. yeah, tangible manifestation of pregnancy, isn't it? Where you can, yeah. For those mm. early weeks where the test says you're pregnant, but you might not feel any differently. Yeah. Mm. It's hard because it's, it's yeah. the unknown and it's the uncertainty. Mm, yeah. And so if we true. can find ways to, nurture ourselves and hold ourselves and ground ourselves in that intense feeling of uncertainty then you know that's a gift to ourselves for the rest of our lives as we learn to navigate life's uncertainty because there is so much of it and we will be hit with it at various different points in our lives Uh, my daughter at the minute I know she's run down she's all like snotty and stuff and uh, I think we're hanging on to the winter colds over here because summer hasn't come (laughs) and I my younger sister she died of cancer when I was 10 and so when my kids so she's saying at the minute mommy my legs are so my brain you know is going oh my gosh she's got some form of childhood cancer this is gonna happen that's gonna happen and I think again it's that it's that same uncertainty it's that same unknown And how can I hold and mother myself through this? I can say, Anna, of course, you're going to be worried because what you've been through, of course, you're going to be worried. But it's most likely because anxiety tends to blow up the statistics, right? It might be a 2% chance or a 15% chance, but, you know, it feels in that anxious moment like a, like a certainty, like the Mm. worst is definitely going to happen in this moment in my pregnancy where I've just felt that this is something bad. When actually, mm. you know, if we hold on to to those statistics, if we hold on to the grounding, those grounding um, things that we that we know to be true, and we just mother that that fear and that uncertainty, and that and, and anxiety does come in waves. Those feelings do come in waves. So I think often we we want to we want to shut it down. We shut it down by going, for goodness sake, cr- criticizing ourselves. Or we shut it down through numbing. You know, we might just dive into like 20 episodes or something on Netflix or just busy it away. When actually, if we allow ourselves to think of these waves of anxiety, like a labor contraction, you know, it peaks where at that point where we're like, oh, I can't do this. This is too much. I'm too scared. I feel too vulnerable. And then it does subside. So the more we can observe and hold ourselves, just as we do with the counting and the contractions, you know, we learn that actually I can withstand this wave of anxiety. I can withstand this, this really intense feeling of uncertainty and it will, it will calm and it will abate. We grow in confidence, I guess. Yeah, it's so true. It's so true. 
Um, I just wanted to move on to actual prenatal depression. Now, mm. what is the difference between feeling a little low and anxious versus prenatal depression? What are the signs and symptoms that we should be looking out for in ourselves, but also in our friends? Yeah. And I think sometimes we need to zoom out and look at the bigger picture because I think prenatal depression can be that slow descent. You know, mm. if you heard of that, um, that metaphor of like the frog, if you put a frog in a bowl of boiling water, it's going to like leap out because it's, you know, it's like, whoa, this is not okay. But if you put the frog in the water and you slowly turn up the temperature, the frog's just going to stay there because it's that slow incremental change. And I think often, you know, depression, prenatal depression can be that slow incremental change where you go from knowing that you're just shattered because you've just become pregnant to knowing that you're feeling a little bit hormonal a bit not quite yourself to actually that just then continuing and increasing and so I think zooming out thinking when did I last laugh when did I last do those things that make me feel like myself when did I last have an intentional conversation think of those things that make you have historically been part of your normal routine and yes make allowances for changes because you're going to be more tired than normal but if you find that you've actually started isolating yourself when normally you're someone who has a couple of really good conversations with mates a week or you know actually you're you're someone that loves to go out on a walk or has a certain workout routine that yes will change most likely but have you been doing you know have you been feeling motivated to do those kind of self-caring nurturing things yeah, are you feeling low more than more than not? So zoom out and just think, when was the last time I actually felt more like myself? Because we all have bad days, we all feel a bit rubbish sometimes. But when those days are merging into kind of weeks and the sunny days are happening less and less often and we find ourselves wanting to kind of retreat and, you know, those those are all flags. But it will look different for different people. But I think it's that sense of heaviness um, that just doesn't lift. And and also I always say to people, if you're even asking the question, am I okay? Am I depressed? Do I need help? When do I get support now? Because if yeah. you're even asking that question, whether you're early on and you're just noticing shifts or you've been there for a while, you are deserving of support, regardless of how many boxes you tick on a list of, on a list of symptoms. And you speak of support there. What, mm. I mean, if, if, let's say I am that person who is feeling this way or someone listening is feeling this way. What, what is the support options out there? Cause I'm guessing, you know, things like medication might not be as um, available during pregnancy as they might be postpartum or in other phases of your life. I mean, what support apart from, you know, therapy and that kind of stuff, what other things are, are options for people out there? What would you suggest? So definitely opening up to friends and family, people that care about you, because they're probably worried. You know, they they might be worried. They might have tentatively said something and like, are you OK? You don't seem yourself. And I think we can really often shut that down, especially if we're someone that finds it much easier to be that supporter role than be supported. And I think also it's it's not leaning into that to that little kind of whisper of what's even the point talking about this because no one can change it for me no one can change how I feel actually not to underestimate the power of and the importance and the therapeutic quality of just talking and feeling heard and validated because as humans we have this really deep need for just to be seen and to be heard and ha being someone who's gone through something in the last year that is one of those kind of curveball life moments you know that no one can fix no one can help no one can change you know, I've just had that re recognition and respect in the in the absolute power of kind of externally processing processing stuff speaking those things out talking saying about how you're feeling and I think there will be those people who you will not feel like a broken record with like they will not you will not be a burden on them and I think remembering that if you're worried about being a burden there is an element of friendship and relationship that is sacrificial sometimes you know sometimes we know that we've had friends that are going through things and it's been going on for a while and every time we have a conversation with them it does seem like nothing's changed and it can feel heavy but we do it because we love them and we want to hear them we want to be there for them and friendship isn't always you know supporting someone in a way that 
you know you've done something really good and that you you've sent them away feeling much better you know the most powerful moments of friendship are those moments where we just sit beside someone and say this is so hard it's really hard right now and I'm here and I love you and I care about you so support might look like speaking to a doctor it might look like telling your healthcare professional that you're having a hard time so that they can put things in place Um, and that will look different depending on where you are but also having those conversations and feeling seen and connected to people uh, means that you won't feel alone in it Um, and also if you are someone that just criticizes yourself and is very heavy on the shoulds you know I should be feeling better I should be feeling grateful I should be feeling great then actually having that external voice that friend saying yeah but I know, I know you're grateful, but also you're just full of hormones. Also, you're standing on that that edge of change. This is a lot. This is a lot for you. So having those validated by someone else, even when you can't do it for yourself, you know, that is really powerful. And for people who, let's say they've experienced mental health issues in the past, I mean, is it something that they should be aware of going into pregnancy? Mm. Is it is it something that often relapses if people have have struggled with mental health in the past? things come up you know during the pregnancy and the postpartum period or does it not really work like that yeah yeah yeah. It absolutely can work like that I think if you're someone who's gone through periods of anxiety or depression then you know any kind of life circumstance where you're piling the pressure on um even you know if it's relationship challenge or job change or or moving moving house you know all of these things when they, there are external things going on can can challenge our resources so pregnancy when you add a load of tiredness and you add some hormones and you add you know changing bodies and and changing changing lives of course that can find us under pressure um but i must say if you have built some really good coping mechanisms you know make sure that as you're heading into pregnancy that you're that you're leaning on those that you're dusting them off that you are yeah, giving yourself whatever you can to give yourself that little bit extra. After um, my second child, I had postnatal depression, anxiety. He had chronic silent reflux and I was also oh God. chronically sleep deprived. Um, and I learned in that intense period of darkness that I needed people, that I needed to talk, that I needed to let people help me, that I needed to lower the bar of my expectations, speak to myself more kindly And I felt an immense level of anxiety going into a third pregnancy. Um, I feel like subsequent pregnancies are often like heart decisions because, you know, mentally you're like, we've ticked these boxes. These, you know, we've had one child. We've now that child has a sibling. Everything is is great. Um, The third child for us was very much a heart decision of we feel like this. Yeah. So it didn't make financial sense. It didn't make, you know, I had friends being like, you know, no one will want you to come to their house. That's life. People will. (laughs) It's also normally the people with multiple kids who are used to living in a state of chaos. So I went into this third pregnancy knowing that it could be hard, knowing that, you know, historical depression, anxiety could return in that pregnancy. But I will say that having put things in place having challenged my perfectionism my people pleasing my my discomfort at letting people there that was it meant that that experience was totally different and I had to really talk coach myself um I remember this one moment that I think um would be really helpful to share to illustrate this was um my friend wanted to come over and meet the baby and I was having an absolute hormonal meltdown day the house was chaos I was chaos it was hard and heavy and it was one of those moments where I was like asking can I do this I don't know if I can do this and I started messaging her saying don't come over I'm a mess and I remember and in that moment I thought Anna you know that you need people you know that mess is just where it's at right now it's not always going to be there so I removed the don't and I said come over I'm a mess and that illustrates the difference in you know that period of darkness and depression the things that I learned and how I was able to sometimes have to really you know push myself to lean Mm. into people and lean into those mechanisms I knew I had to get out every day in some context I knew I had to have a verbal conversation with someone every day be it on the phone be it them coming over being flying by their house flopping on their sofa letting them make me a drink 
you know I I knew that I had to do those things to be okay and it was you know it was messy it was chaotic it was full-on but I didn't I didn't go through the same mental health challenges to the same extent. So if you are someone who has experienced depression, and anxiety, and you've done so much work and you've gathered so many tools, you might fear that oh, I'm going to go there again. But if you hold on to those tools and you coach yourself, even when you want to pull up the drawbridge, you know, it, it can very well look different. So it's encouraging That's as really well. Nice. Yeah. Brace yourself. Really that makes me but, feel better. Yeah, yeah, it was a, it was actually really healing and therapeutic going into that third third pregnancy and postnatal period, and knowing that I had an armful of tools, and yeah. that, that I was going to approach things differently, mm. even if it wasn't comfortable. I think that's 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 the thing I'm most excited about. Um, I think, well, obviously that and having the baby and having the new addition. Yeah, but um, I went straight from being pregnant to you know I went back to work three days later I worked for myself and um I was gonna give myself a week and then I had a meeting and I had thought I had to go to this meeting and so there I am like three days out of hospital in my maternity jeans just suffering um and suffering more mentally than I was physically and I think this time now a friend of mine I remember she said to me you know when I had my second I stayed in bed for five days around the bed for five days and then in the house mm, for five days so yeah. 15 days doing very little and I was like that is gonna yeah. be me good and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get people to bring me tea and snacks and I'm good. just gonna lounge around and not move and I'm very excited about it yeah write yourself a letter write your future yes. self a letter and say look Marianne I know that this is what we decided that you were going to do. And I know that driven you is probably going to want to, you know, actually cut that to two days or one and a half day or two hours. And you're going to think of all the stuff that needs to get done downstairs. Trust me, we will get that stuff done or you can ask someone else to do it. But this Mm -hmm. is important. And this, we're doing this because we don't, we want to give you breathing space that you didn't have last time. We want to hold boundaries that you didn't hold last time. No one's going to give you a medal for jumping out of bed after one day Mm. or or one hour so I I love that idea I also sometimes think that us that knows what we need needs to write the future us a letter a letter um to really hold that boundary because when you're in the fog of hormones and you're feeling you know and the kids are wanting you and there's that excitement but also that tiredness that that resolve might wane so you know maybe write something so that you can read it and give yourself a pep talk and make yourself like, get back in bed yeah I'm gonna I'm gonna do this I'm definitely gonna do this um and before we come on to the book which I really want to discuss I wanted to quickly touch upon another big pregnancy fear that I know lots of mums feel when they're especially I think I mean you, you can tell me about two to three but I think mostly they feel it from going from one to two there's so much guilt around leaving you're first to go to even just go to the hospital to have the second baby and you're worried how you're going to love this unborn child as much as you love this existing child and I remember feeling that fear and thinking how how can I love anything more than this perfect little being that I made how can we cope with that because I mean I know now having gone through it before your love your love just multiplies but no matter how much people told me that I was like well I don't believe you I won't be that person. <laughs> it's it's so different though. I remember with my first, I felt exactly the same way. And then when I had my second, I looked at this tiny little baby and I was like, I don't know you. I don't know mm. who you are. You know, I had a relationship with my toddler. We'd done stuff. We'd made memories. I got to know him as character. And I think it's fully understandable when you know and love one child, you know them. And then you have a baby that is yours and you love it for that but also you you don't know you don't have a relationship with that baby yet beyond being yeah. its mother so i think yes your love multiplies yes your heart enlarges yes all of those things but also it's understandable that it's going to feel different it's understandable and and there is a grief you know there's a grief and we don't always grieve things that are bad or things that are lost but actually there is a kind of loss when you go from once to there's a loss of normal 
there's a loss yes. of that dynamic there's a loss of everything you've grown to know and love and it's going to change and it's okay to to grieve that change it doesn't mean that you're not that you're not excited and happy it doesn't mean it's bad change like I did a post about this actually the other day about how you know it's okay to grieve when you move house it's okay to grieve when you change jobs it's okay to grieve having an you know having an extra child or grieving a season of their lives that you know now they're teenagers and you're grieving the younger versions of them and that's it's okay it doesn't mean it's not good change it doesn't mean you're you're not loving what you're walking into so allow all those complex feelings and yeah when it comes to the guilt for leaving your child you know it's hard it's hard it might be challenging for them but it doesn't mean again it doesn't mean it's bad like yeah. hard hard doesn't have to be bad it's there's going to be all kinds of little separations that happen in increasing ways over the years and you know i i always say i think my kid is safe and they're loved mm. they are safe and they're loved just right now by me from afar <laughs> But they are with people who make them feel safe and make them feel loved. And yes, there might be confusion. And yes, there might be a bit of kind of separation, anxiety. But that's all really normal and healthy. Yeah. It actually just shows that that relationship is healthy. Um, and and there might be points when your kid is like, uh, the baby was cute now. Can you send it back? Um, that was fun. That was fun now. Take it back send it back and that's all it's all really normal and natural yes like things when they grow in nature there's like a groaning as things as things grow you know growth isn't always pretty and it can be really uncomfortable but but it's it's also good um yeah. so yeah grieve let yourself grieve let yourself think man it's weird because i know my toddler and this baby is an unknown to me and i will get to know my baby but I've got some catching up to do. So don't expect yourself to feel the same. Um, and love, sometimes love is a grower um, because it grows with relationship. And I think when we have our first baby, we don't know what it's like to know them. So we're just kind of uh, enthralled with this love for this being. But second time around, you're like, yeah, you're, you're gorgeous. And I'm, I'm excited to get to know you, but I don't know you. <laughs> so true it's so true it is intriguing though I am very yeah. having known these two and how different my kids are I'm very yeah. intrigued to see oh, what number three so interesting brings. yeah yeah mm. all excitement um now I want to touch upon your new book the uncomfortable truth before we wrap up today this is so exciting can you please tell us a little bit more about this book oh, and where thanks. people can find it so it's really, I think, having worked with anxiety, experienced anxiety for so many years as a therapist, I think kind of 13 years as a therapist, I think there are so many ways to encourage ourselves, not worry about people pleasing, not worry about bad things happening. Not, And we can put so much energy into reassuring each other that that person's probably not judging you, that bad thing won't happen, when actually wouldn't it be so much more powerful to just come to a new place of acceptance that bad things do happen. You know, so how can we find ways to make the most of the good stuff? Some people won't like us. And that's probably nothing to do with us at all. Might be, might not be. But actually, if we don't spend so much time and energy on the worrying and the needing to reassure assure ourselves that we can put that energy into enjoying the relationships that are mutually, mutually enjoyable. And yeah if we can just accept that some people will judge us, then we can feel freed up to be more ourselves. And when it comes to loss, so some of the really challenging truths are that we're going to lose people, that, that bad things happen, and that we ourselves will, will die one day. Instead of fearing and worrying about those things and letting them be the topics of our nightmares and our deepest fears, what if we can actually become more accepting of those truths so that we can live more intentionally and more fully and more aligned with our values and yeah it's just kind of really transformed my life actually and enabled me to just be less tethered to worry and live more authentically and intentionally um, so this. I'm just excited I'm excited for people to have it so it's called the uncomfortable truth and it's uh, it's about changing your life by taming 10 of your mind's greatest fears and you can get it you know wherever you get your books hopefully is it going to be on audio as well as yeah, yeah. book 
Ooh. Yeah, audio book, Kindle, all of that. Yeah. <gasps> so exciting. And have you done all the audio yourself? I have. Yeah. Oh my gosh, you've been busy, Anna. I've been so busy. I know. And I had to split it out because I had um I had some horrible cold. So as soon as I started sounding coldy, I was like, I can't, no one wants to listen to this. <laughs> oh, how exciting. Okay, that's fantastic. Thank we you. will obviously link everything into the show notes so people can buy it. And I, for one, am going to be um, I'm going to be downloading it. I mean, it's it's going to be out by the time this episode airs, but just for my own knowledge, remind me so I can set a reminder. And is it available for pre-order now as well? It is available for pre-order and is out on the 8th of August. 8th of Bright August. yellow. So, very Love sunny colour. Big trees. This is but... what you need. This yeah, is what, it's well, I know. you guys in yeah. the UK need. <laughs> it's the brightest thing in my, in my life right now, this bright yellow sunshine that I wish I could see oh. out the window, but I can't. I love this. Um, and Anna, before we say goodbye to you today, we always ask our guests to share one tip and one product based mm. on the conversation. So, if you were to leave us with two nuggets, what would they be today? Okay, one tip is cut corners. Cut Ooh. corners where you can. Yeah, cutting corners is a very valid form of self care. Um, and you might feel you might be someone that actually always likes doing things properly. But I always say it's not forever; it's just for now. And you can recoup something of yourself, be it time, energy, yeah, some top up your resource by just cutting a corner in some way. Um, and a oh. Um, a product I've just bought a banging water bottle um, and I would say that a dehydrated body is a stressed body so if you're someone that often kind of feels a little bit on edge a little bit frazzled a little bit reactive that actually it might be that your nervous system's already struggling because you're thirsty so drink Get yourself a lovely bottle and just carry it around with you and just make sure that you are hydrated because it will actually make you a more patient person, which is amazing. Oh, yeah. I love this. I love this. This has been one of my biggest pregnancy symptoms so far, which I'm finding particularly strange, is I'm thirsty all the time. I Ooh. mean, I must be drinking about eight litres of water a day. Whoa, that is a lot, I'm isn't it? I haven't drowned myself Whoa. to be fair. Yeah, yeah, that I'm, is a lot of water. I hope you've got a good a bottle. Lot. Um, got a good bottle or are you a, is it the glasses uh, I'm, i've got a i've got a camel back i've got like five oh, of yeah, these yeah yeah, yeah. Just um, dotted around so the i house. just rotate through Brilliant. and um i mean as you can imagine my my bathroom trips are frequent oh gosh that's that's the annoying thing isn't it when you uh, when you are more hydrated but it gets uh, you up and moving yeah, and well, especially if you're true, working at you. a desk yeah yeah so walking around your house <laughs> in the air con <laughs> And Anna, before we say goodbye, um, can you please tell everybody where they can find you if they want to reach out, ask any questions, say hi? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm at Anna Martha on Instagram and everything else is kind of linked from there, really. Oh, Come and thank find you so me. Much. Anna, you've been incredible. Thank you so much for your time today. We've loved having you back on Mother Tongue. Keep in touch and we hope to see oh, we hope to be seeing you again very thank soon. Thank you for having me. I have thank loved you. chatting. Right, just stay there for two seconds while everything loads up. I'm gonna 